we've been here in Hout Bay near Cape Town in South Africa for a couple of months now. And what we've mostly been doing here is maintenance and upgrade to Florence, ready for the next 18 months of our Around the World voyage. To get from here in Cape Town back home to England, we've actually got to cross the Atlantic two more times as we follow the trade winds to the Caribbean and then home to England across the North Atlantic. We're going to be sailing about 8,000 miles as we cross the Atlantic twice. So we're using this time here in Cape Town to make sure that Florence is fully prepared and ready for this next stage of our adventure. As usual, we're going to be visiting remote places where it is often difficult or impossible to get spare parts of Florence. So in this video, we're going to share with you some of the maintenance, repairs, replacements and upgrades that we've been making to Florence to get her ready. We are Matt and Amy. We left England in 2016 on a mission to sail around the world. Just the two of us on our 37 foot sailboat Florence. Five years on we have sailed over 35,000 miles across three oceans, exploring new countries and cultures along the way. So this is our electric anchor windlass in pieces. That's the motor, this is the gearbox, and the chain wheel and everything. Um, normally we use this all of the time, and so I'm kind of a little bit loath to take it apart, especially where we're in far-flung islands where we can't get any parts. But now we're in South Africa, we're mostly staying in marinas, so it's a good opportunity to strip this out and check it out and make sure there's no problems with it. And you are supposed to replace the oil, but I haven't found a YouTube video yet on how to replace the oil. I'm not sure whether I'm going to make one, I'm not sure I'm qualified, but uh, yeah, it's just now that we're staying in Marinas, it's a good opportunity to get this sort of maintenance done before we go back out and start using the anchor all the time again. It's never straightforward though, there's always one bolt that doesn't come undone or something. Just inspecting the anchor chain. Uh, this is probably going to be one of the first things that's a real big expense as a result of us spending an extra year stuck in Indonesia because of the pandemic. Uh, we were supposed to get this regalvanized last year uh, because it started to go a little rusty but now it's been a whole year we've been using it, we've been living at anchor all the time and it's now gone really rusty so I'm just chipping off the rust and seeing how much metal we've got left underneath but it's much much cheaper to get it regalvanized but unfortunately, I think this has gone a little bit too far and I think we actually need to buy a whole new chain because uh, it's just lost too much, too much meat, too much metal. Well, that's not too bad, but it's still nine mil, not the 10 mil it's supposed to be, but that is not the worst link. Yeah, we have 10 millimeter chain on Florence and she'd probably be okay with eight millimeter chain. So this is a bit overkill, which is what you normally do on a cruising boat. You have a bit bigger than you need because you need to be out in, anchored in big winds. Um, but yeah, this is just, just lost too much of its strength for us to have confidence in it. So I think we're gonna have to bite the bullet and buy new. Yeah, that's, I think that's the worst one I've seen so far. That's six and a half millimeter of metal left from a 10 millimeter chain. So there's no two ways about it. We need to replace that. Luckily, for the first time in over two years, we are somewhere that we can just buy anchor chain off of the shelf. On top of that, we are very fortunate that we have been lent a car here in Cape Town, which means it's easy to drive into town and pick up a new chain for Florence. Not something we would have wanted to transport on our folding bikes, as it weighs 132 kilos. So we've got shiny new anchor chain and we've gone for the more expensive stuff that is branded and stamped with its uh, load rating so that we know that it's going to be safe to hold Florence because it is what is holding our home. So it wasn't cheap and uh, now we've got to sort it all out to go back on board so we actually can take off the 20 meter long rope that we had to have through Indonesia because now we're in shallower anchorages but we still splice a rope onto the end and the reason for that is so that this can if we have to let all the anchor chain out if we've got an emergency we can let it all out this rope will come up through the windlass so that we can see it and then we can cut it if we really have to and then the other end of the rope is just a short rope and that will tie on in the anchor locker. So 
we've bought 60 meters of new chain which is exactly what we had before and that has been absolutely fine plenty of chain everywhere we've gone in the world except for indonesia so hopefully from here on we should be fine with 60 meters again because the chain is new it means that we've got to remark it uh, so that we know when we come into an anchorage how much chain we're letting out so we get the right ratio to the depth We've been able to reuse our plastic markers from the old chain. I was just able to wash off the rust and the mud. Um, they've lasted us four years already, so hopefully we'll get another four years out of those. These do pop out sometimes, but it tends to be when they're going round the windlass inside the anchor locker, so I can just pick them out of the anchor locker. Ready? We're in the industrial area of Cape Town. We seem to be spending quite a lot of time here at the moment getting boat parts, but today we're hoping to get our life raft service. It's actually well overdue a service. We last had it done in England, and because we were stuck in Indonesia for a year where there was nowhere to get a service, it's now well past the date that it should have been done. So we're hoping that they're gonna be able to service it and it's all okay. Otherwise, we'll end up having to buy a complete new one, uh, which is incredibly expensive. At first sight, our life raft does not look great. It looks like the vacuum bag has deteriorated. The question is, is there any damage to the life raft inside? At this point, we were horrified with what we saw. Oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, not only was the cost of a new life raft looming in our minds, but the fact that we have just sailed across one of the world's most inhospitable oceans with a potentially non-functional life raft. Although we were horrified, Ashley, the life raft technician, promised us that he had seen worse, so we went ahead with testing it. As part of the service, life rafts are inflated and left pumped up for 24 hours to check that there are no leaks. Then they are fully inspected and any items within the life raft that have gone out of date, such as batteries, flares or emergency food and water, are replaced. It's a really good idea to see your life raft being inflated. So should the worst situation occur, you know what to expect when you pull the string. This is the second time we have seen ours, as we had it serviced just before we left England at the start of this voyage. It was a massive relief to see our life raft inflate correctly. Well, this is life raft inflated, and it did inflate, and it is at the moment holding pressure. It now has to stay inflated for overnight until tomorrow. And if it's still inflated then, then the life raft although it needs a clean, is good. Which and is, a lot of things replacing. It needs some things replacing, it needs the light replacing, so that didn't actually turn on when we inflated it. Um, and obviously all the, the water and the flares are all out of date, they need replacing. But the big expense is the life raft. So if this is okay, stays inflated, then that's awesome, because we won't have that massive expense to replace. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge reminder of why those service intervals are in place in the first place. And, and that you really shouldn't push um, beyond them because it's quite scary looking at the state of our life raft. It's obviously not something you can get out and check um, and it's covered in this residue that we're not really sure what it is. Um, it's going to be interesting what it looks like when it's had a clean. It normally lives in a vacuum bag in the cockpit so it's sealed but I think that vacuum bag just because it's we've been on in the tropics for so many years and also the life raft locker is directly above the engine bay so I think it gets heat from above from the sun and from below from the engine so I think that made the vacuum bag deteriorate um, and that I think is possibly why it's not in as good of a condition as we would have liked. Yeah but I am very glad that we're getting this serviced and are not crossing another ocean <laughs> with yeah. the life raft in this state and I'm quite upset with ourselves that we've sailed down the wild coast um, with a life raft like, like this, this. <laughs> yeah. to be honest, but unfortunately we didn't really have much other option. Sorry mum, yeah. we do things safely, honestly. I think this is probably its last service, we'll probably have to buy a new life raft when we get back to the UK. Inside the life raft we have our pack with some emergency water in, 
uh, some flares in, but most of the things that we would need with us we have in a grab bag next to the life raft, which means we can easily replace them when they go out of date um, and also keep the food in date as well. But inside is little things like a package with some paddles in, there's a throwing rope in case somebody's away from the raft, you need to pull them in. Yeah, but there's not much in here. Most of the stuff that we take with us, like our EPUB, VHF radio, uh, sat phone, all those things we have prepared in a grab bag, which we need to grab if Florence is sinking before we jump into the life raft with it. Now, this is a four man life raft, and the, but the thought of being in here with three other people would be no room. There's barely enough room for Amy and myself. Um, I really hope we never, ever have to get in this life raft apart from when it's being serviced. <laughs> Thankfully, the life raft stayed inflated and was able to be cleaned, serviced and repacked. So we now have it back on board Florence and it should last until we arrive home in England. Florence's canvas has been in need of some attention for a while now. We had this restitched in Thailand, but after a couple of years, uh, the stitching just tends to die in all the UV that we've been in in the tropics and the, the windows, certainly the one in the centre, had gone a bit opaque, so we couldn't really see through it anymore. We really wanted a whole new spray hood, but it didn't quite fit within the budget with all the other things we wanted to do. But what we have done is we've had this one uh, repaired and strengthened. We've had a new window put in the middle here. We've had new Velcro put in. We've got new clips on the corners so that we can secure it much better, especially when what's going to happen in a year and a half's time is the Velcro is going to be dead again. Uh, so we've beefed up our spray hood and we've got a new shade piece that goes between the spray hood and the bimini and that goes around the corners a little bit more now so it provides a little bit more shade in the cockpit it's also a lot stronger the old one was held on by velcro and when it got really windy it tended to just blow off so this one's much more securely fastened and we've already had it up still in 45 knots of wind here and it uh, survived so that's really good uh, our bimini's been renewed pretty much the same design as before just a bit stronger the old one was getting weak with uv and all the stitching had completely died from the uv cool. <laughs> on top of repairing and replacing the existing canvas we've got a new piece of canvas which we're actually pretty excited about we've got a new cockpit tent coming it's a design we've made ourselves because we've got to be careful with where our wind vane is we can't have a full cockpit tent otherwise it block the wind getting to the wind vane so this is a new design, it's something we'd really like to try out. One of the few things that we would like to improve on Florence is the amount of protection we have in the cockpit when sailing offshore, especially when it's cold or raining. At the moment, we just end up out in the rain getting wet. So this, hopefully, is gonna make life a lot more comfortable when sailing offshore. Right, let's have a look at this cockpit tent then. The design of this tent has been developed over many hours of sitting on watch in the rain. <laughs> coupled with a couple of hours at anchor with bed sheets and bits of string to mock it up. We then worked with Burton from Bermuda Bags and Canvas here in Cape Town to make a pattern and turn it into reality. At the front it zips onto our existing spray hood and at the back we have a batten to stop the back edge flapping and it ties to the binnacle and the bimini frame. We wanted it to be quick to put up and take down and it must not block the airflow to our airy self-steering. How's this? So now we have an enclosed cockpit, which this is going to be so much more comfortable when it's raining because normally in the past I've literally been huddled up here when it's been raining because we've got a, uh, previously we just had a clear screen that went straight down there and you had to kind of huddle here, it's the only way to stay out of the rain. But now we can sit in comfort, we can see out the windows and if we need to get out we can unzip one side and get out. And then at the back, we've just left it open, so we can easily get out at the back if we need to. And see where we're going. So we hope this is going to make a massive difference to our comfort when sailing in cold weather and rainy weather, because we can be able to be in the cockpit without getting exposed to the elements. And it's also part of our sneaky plan for couple of years from now so when we get home to the UK we're not planning on actually stopping cruising although that will complete our circumnavigation to home we're planning to go north up to Norway and Iceland and places where it's going to be a bit cooler than it is in the normal tropical places we go so we're hoping that this is going to give us a little bit more protection. We designed it like this with the roof coming down towards the wheel because we need the air to still be able to get through to the wind vane at the back of the boat, which is what we use to steer most of the time. We're not like a lot of the modern boats which just use an electric autopilot, we use our mechanical wind vane self-steering. 
and that stops us having a full cockpit tent that would just block out any wind flowing to that part of the boat. Well, for once, the howling winds in Hout Bay are actually helping us because they're blowing from the bow at the moment, which means I've been able to put the wind vane on the back of the boat and test how much this new tent blocks the airflow going to it. And it looks like it's working fine. So hopefully things will all be okay. And I'm really excited to try this out sailing up the coast on our next passage up to Namibia. One of the main things we need to fix here in South Africa before we sail on across the South Atlantic Ocean is our VHF radio. Now, if you watch the videos when we were sailing down the Mozambique Channel, you might recall that we were able to receive broadcasts from yachts quite a long way away, no problem, but our VHF radio could not transmit very far. We could only reach boats that were so about three miles away from us. Most of the time we're sailing across oceans, there's no other yachts around, so the VHF radio not having a great transmit range is not too much of an issue, it doesn't really make a difference. But when we were sailing with our yachts, we really realized that if we had a problem, they're only a short distance away, but we wouldn't be able to call them on the VHF to, to get any help. So we investigated what the problem might be, and we took the cable out that goes comes down the mast from the antenna at the top and down to the radio. We cut it open. When we cut that open, we found a lot of corrosion inside the cable. So what we've done is we've replaced the cable up the inside of the mast, and we've also replaced the VHF antenna on top of the mast. This is the, this is the old one. It has a wind indicator slotted onto it. Not only was the cable corroded going up to it, but the plastic surround where the cable screws in to the antenna was all UV degraded, so the plastic's all brittle, it's all kind of... When I took it off, it literally fell apart in my hands, and it was only really held together by the insulation tape that I'd had on it up there. So we've replaced the whole of that as well. So that's entirely new antenna on top of the mast, entirely new cable coming down the mast. There's another cable that goes from the bottom of the mast round behind me and to the VHF radio at the chart table and that one was also corroded on the inside, so I've got a brand new bit of cable to replace that with and new connectors to put in. And then the other problem we had was the VHF radio itself. The push to talk button on the radio was intermittently not working, so it would sound like our voice was broken up when we were trying to speak on the radio. And unfortunately, I cannot get a replacement little handset or I, I can't get in to fix the, the push to talk button because it's all sealed inside. So we've ended up having to buy a new VHF radio and because of the current world supply problems, there's difficulty getting radios. So just got the only one that we could get here in South Africa in Cape Town that was available in stock. Uh, and we're going to fit that. And that, fingers crossed, will fix, should fix everything because it's all going to be completely new. So I've got to run the cable round from the bottom of the mast all the way around to the chart table area. And of course, with any job on Florence that normally involves emptying a whole load of boxes and lockers. Okay, so now we can get to where the cables come in from the bottom of the mast. They come down the mast and they come through this hole here into our, one of our spares lockers. And then the antenna cable disappears up this hole and then somehow goes around behind all of the cupboards and everything. Hopefully it's in a cable channel and I can use the old one to pull the new one through rather than having to empty the entire side of one side of Florence. So I've disconnected the connections to the old radio so that can come out just like that and now I need to remove the instrument panel drop that down so I can get in behind that and get to where the antenna comes through hopefully. Now forgive me for how it looks behind here, it's a little bit of a mess, but it's a lot less of a mess than it was before we bought uh, aerial cable. There's this one, goes up there and it goes into this, there's actually a bit of drain pipe that runs all the way across the back there, it goes into that and hopefully it runs through that all the way forward. But unfortunately, when I try and move that back and forth, it's getting stuck halfway somewhere in that channel, so... I'll just, I don't know, this is not going to be easy. It's never easy. Welcome to Boat Work on Florence. Every single corner of the boat, messed up, emptied out, innards everywhere, life on a small boat. Okay, fast forward an hour or so, you can skip the sweaty cursing. But now I've exposed this, I've taken all the stereo and the bookcase out here. And now I can get to this pipe that runs all the way back to behind the instrument panel there at the back. And I've actually, I can actually move the cable, it runs reasonably freely. So I was able to pull the new cable through, which just left connecting up the power to the new VHF radio. 
Well, like all boat jobs, that took a lot longer than planned. That's new VHF installed, so with a bit of luck, be able to turn it on. Yes. So it's got the right MMSI programmed in, and all we need to do now is test it. Calypso, Calypso, Florence, Florence, Channel 10, over. Florence, this is Calypso, I copy you, do you read me, over? Uh, Calypso, I read you loud and clear, how is my signal, over? I read you loud and clear, there is a bit of uh, um, hazy noise in the background, but I am at Dacre Island, so there's quite a big mountain between us. Considering that, um, the signal is pretty good, over. That's fantastic, thank you. No problem, have a nice day, standing by one zero. This is an upgrade that we've been wanting to make on Florence for a long time. This is a new AIS transponder box from M-Track, but the key thing about this is it has a built-in antenna splitter. So instead of using a low-down mounted AIS aerial, which we've got on the back of Florence at the moment, it's only about a metre or two above the water, with this we can use the VHF aerial, which is at the top of the mast, 16 metres above the water, and that means we get a much greater range and we should be able to see ships much further off and they should be able to see us. One of the beautiful things about this is how easily it fits into our existing system. We just disconnect the VHF aerial from the back of the VHF radio and plug it into the AS transponder box instead. And then there's a coax cable that comes with this that plugs from the transponder back into the VHF radio. So now the signal's going through the transponder and now the VHF works just as it did before. And then we plug in power and then we, we're going to connect via uh, NMEA 0183 into this because we've got a pretty old school system but it's got NEMA 2000 for the for the more modern systems and an optional uh, GPS antenna, external GPS antenna, although it does have an internal one if you don't have an external one, but we do so we'll reuse it. And then it should just work. I've already connected to the laptop and programmed with our MMSI, so I'm going to turn it on. Should come up working. Right, so that black triangle there is us on the chart, and if I zoom out, I hopefully will see some other black triangles, which are other boats appearing on AIS, which we do have. So that enables us to see, and this will be interesting to see how far out to see we can see anybody. Okay, so these black triangles, this is what we see when we're um, navigating at sea. Other ships will come up with these triangles, it tells us the name of the ship. Uh, this dotted line tells us the direction it's going and it's going to be at the end of that dotted line in half an hour's time and I can click enter on it and it'll give me the name of the ship, all the details about the ship. That one's a tanker and that one is actually 15 miles away, which is uh, we would probably have not seen that ship 15 miles away with our old AIS because the antenna was too low, but wow, look how far we can see now. So we've gone from having a range of sort of like maybe 10 miles maximum, and that one is 35 miles away, 34 miles away. Well, that's going to make my life a lot easier when we are out at sea because we'll be able to see the boats coming, see the ships coming much further off and importantly they will be able to see us coming further off as well. So after I checked it all worked last night, this morning I've tidied up all the wiring behind the chart table there and cable tied everything so it's all nicely secured and strain relieved and I was just checking that it still worked after I'd fiddled around with the cabling and I found I could see an AIS target, a tanker, 88 miles out to sea which is pretty phenomenal really considering we were used to being able to only see things about maybe four, five miles, 10 miles maximum. It's gonna make life a lot easier and a lot safer. Our old bilge pump, even though it still works, the automatic sensor for when there's water in the bilge stopped working so we couldn't just leave it on, otherwise it would just continuously run even when there wasn't any water. So here in South Africa at least we can get a new one. So we've taken the opportunity to fit a larger capacity one. So if we are thinking at least it will pump out the water a little bit quicker. We're also going to change the pipe to the bilge pump because it's a larger capacity pump so it needs a bigger diameter pipe.
Right, now it's time to do a job that I've been putting off for as long as possible. And that's because it means I've got to go in the water here and it's so cold. There are fur seals here and they've got a lot more insulation than I have. I've got to replace the keel cooler anodes, which are these two little small anodes. They bolt onto our keel cooler for the fridge. And they only, they're so small, they only last about six months. And last time I did it, we were in tropical waters and it was no problem whatsoever, but it's so cold here. I've got my wetsuit on and Amy's wetsuit on. I've already been in this morning to clean off a whole load of growth off the propeller and off the keel cooler so I can see and check that these definitely do need replacing and unfortunately they do. And it's so cold it's taken me the rest of the day to warm up. I had to go and buy a, a wetsuit hood to try and keep myself a little bit warmer this afternoon. And I've been putting it off and putting it off. Uh, I really don't want to do this. But no, no choice, got to get in got to go and do it. The only other way to do it is to haul the boat out and that will cost a fortune and is pointless for just replacing some anodes. Need lots of weights to take me down with all this neoprene, buoyant neoprene on. Well, that didn't go to plan. I've just got back from a long hot shower to warm up. I managed to get the screws out that hold the uh, anodes in. They came out really easily and I managed not to drop them, which was good, and I didn't drop the Allen key. But unfortunately, I couldn't get the old anodes off. They uh, seemed to be welded on to the keel cooler. So comparing them to these ones, there is actually still probably half of each anode left, which is more than I thought, but I can't get them off. So I don't know, uh, I think I might just have to wait and let them degrade down or erode away a bit more and then try and change them again a bit later on. Anyway, that's boat jobs. They never go to plan. They always take longer than you think. This is just a snapshot of the work we completed here, but now we hope Florence is ready to take on the South Atlantic passage to the Caribbean. Next time, we heed the call of the ocean and set out of Hout Bay for Cape Town, ready to check out of South Africa and sail on across the Atlantic. Don't forget to subscribe to catch the next episode. We release a video every two weeks. If you'd like to find out more about behind the scenes on Florence, track our progress across the oceans in real time, find out where we are right now or ask us pretty much anything, then please head over to our Patreon site and join the crew. We'd like to thank everyone who supports us to make these videos possible. And a special thank you to our star patrons. We're sailing again!